Coming up on Nebraska Stories, they call it Day of the Dead, and it's nothing like Halloween. Music and art created in secret in a village called Terezin. Compassion and acceptance on the Nebraska prairie. And scenes from a dream car auction. Everyone dies, but no one wants to be forgotten. Dia de los Muertos opens a door for the dead to return briefly to the physical world. The celebration within the community is a moment where death becomes life. Laughter overcomes sorrow. Memory overcomes oblivion. Eternity lives and coexists with the present. Poetry, music, dancing. Celebrating Dia de los Muertos, Day of the Dead. They say there are three deaths. The first one is when you die. Uh, the second one is when your body is no longer visible, that you're either cremated or buried. And the third is the worst, is when you're forgotten. We're at the Bancroft Gallery in South Omaha. It's the time of year when people dress up for Halloween, but this isn't Halloween. Instead, it's a time when a door is opened, briefly, for the dead to return to the physical world. To tempt the spirits, families put food and drink by their graves, and they create offerings known as ofrendas. You put out their favorite things. It just is not food, it's cigarettes, their favorite beer, their favorite beverage, their favorite candy, for the spirit to let them know that they are welcome. It's giving gratitude to their lives. And once they've absorbed the essence of smell, then you take those same foods and offer it to your family and friends who are visiting. I always equated Dia de los Muertos with our Memorial Day. And it's a day for sadness. It's a day to remember your losses. I've learned Dia de los Muertos is a day when you go back to the grave and you let your ancestors, your family that are gone, come and visit with you, sit down and exchange with you, be with you. The Mexican people believe that their relatives come and share that moment with them. And because of their distance, it is a celebration of life. I've been missing you so much. We're a family. Our artists and our musicians are families to us now. Celebrating Dia de los Muertos goes beyond South Omaha. También me dijo un arriero que no hay que llegar primero. These are all candies for the spirits. I mean, if you wanted to, you can bring a photo of somebody that you want to be publicly honored and remembered. You can bring it. It's Day of the Dead at the Sheldon Art Gallery in Lincoln. It's a holiday that brings the whole family together. And this is a holiday that Sheldon can have that can bring the whole community together as well. It's uh, very family friendly, as you can see. It's also a cultural understanding. They can learn something that they may not otherwise see in your everyday life. Everything on the ofrenda has meaning. The flowers, especially marigolds, are known as flor de muerto, flowers of the dead. But above all, the ofrenda is personal. I had a friend who died when she was 17, and every year her family and friends will put Hello Kitty and goldfish crackers on her headstone because that is what she loved. The spirits will like to hear that music. I've been in cemeteries where mariachi band will be there the entire day playing music all day to the headstones because they believe the spirits are there and they would like to hear the music that they listened to when they were alive. 
I have to say that culturally, I grew up in Los Angeles where Dia de los Muertos is celebrated everywhere, um, you know, on, on, at this time of year. The, the sugar skulls is something I always remember as a kid. We always wanted to get a sugar skull and, and sink our teeth on them and, uh, and, and, you know, give it to death, you know. So death has been a, a part of our thinking forever. And again, not in a scary way, but you can see some of the artwork they see here. It's playful, it's colorful, it's joyful. It's not necessarily a scary thing. I think the most important part in terms of culture that I can think of is the Aztecs and the Mayans and the Indians in Mexico, when they were forced the Catholic religion upon them, they really modified it. They didn't accept it the way the Europeans thought that we had accepted it, but we modified it, and this is the result of that. There's a paradise where food and drink abound. The colors, the flavors, the sounds and rhythms multiply through the dances, the music, and the offerings. Back in South Omaha at the Bancroft Gallery, the Ballet Folklorico Xochitl continues its performance, surrounded by the art of Dia de los Muertos. We take a few weeks and we just pile all of the paints and all of the things that we need to get everything done and we throw on mariachi music and get out the tequila and just spend a whole lot of time and completely destroy the dining room for two weeks, create a whole bunch of pieces and then... And drink more tequila. <laughs> yes. Music to my bones, this year's theme at the gallery, inspired Wayne Brecky to create something new out of an old guitar. This actually opens up, and this was the way he gave it to me. So I made art out of it. And inside is the cantina uh, of the dead, and, and this is where they all get to come in, and, and the spirits come in, and they get to have a great time. Death inspires each artist in a unique way. For the most part, it just comes from my heart, uh, because dying is a celebration of living, and uh, it's what I create, what I feel. I've often felt like I've had a foot in two different worlds and not quite fitting in either. I use a lot of house paint. I use a lot of domestic materials that um, everybody already has a relationship with. It's been a lot of fun. I've learned a lot. And this was a really good way for me to reconnect to part of my culture. The first painting that I did was, was this one, and it's um, Birdsong to the Dead. and. Looking at the theme of music, uh, really birds, sort of nature is my church. And when I think about my parents who are both deceased and the people who I've loved, a lot of times walking in the woods was sort of like our communion with the spiritual world. And so I wanted the idea of bird songs for the deceased to be sort of the thread that wove through my work. My brother, uh, Johnny, we called him Johnny, he died when he was... 15, 14, 15, and he was a trumpet player. He had a form of cerebral palsy, and he, his head would go perpetually back and forth, back and forth. But when he put the trumpet up to his mouth, he could calm himself and stay perfectly still while he played. You know, it just touches me to think that his story is continuing even though he's been gone so long. No one dies as long as you remember them. Dave Manriquez remembers the night his rock and roll heroes, Richie Valens and Buddy Holly, died in a plane crash. It was really sad when I walked into the house. It was, it was like a relative had died. And uh, just, and, you know, they were playing the songs that they sang. And, uh, and you know, cold February 3rd day, uh, the day the music died, I titled it in my painting. And the ofrenda is really great because it, it's uh, not only a ofrenda, but it's a retablo. It tells the story of their death because I actually have the plane crash. I have the cars, the automobiles at the site. I, I did the best I could. Dearest, though you and what's interesting is like I saw a movie the other day and they had an old Buddy Holly song in it I had never heard before. It was called Dearest. And I went out and bought the soundtrack just for that one song. So it's, it's really neat. So it's like these, these never gone away.
I think in our own way, we all want to be remembered for something. I think that's all in an eight as a human being. With the first light of dawn, comes time to say goodbye to our dead. They will go back to their world, and we will return to ours. It is the time for the last prayer, perhaps the most devoted one. We Latinos take our time to say goodbye. We like togetherness. And when somebody leaves our home, we go to the door or even outside the house just to be together with them a little longer. Who would expect a Nazi concentration camp to inspire children today? An Omaha program resurrects the music and art created in secret in a village called Terezin. Friedel Dicker Brandeis was 44 years old when she first saw the Jewish ghetto, Terezin. She was greeted by soldiers with guns, thousands of people lining the streets, and total confusion. There is a thirst for trying to understand this very difficult history, and I think that our world is difficult today, and people want to know how to make it a better place. As an artist, Friedel Dicker Brandeis had worked with children before. She knew Terezin would be a frightening place for them. So in her luggage, Friedel packed paint, brushes, paper, and books. Not for herself, but for the children. Surrounded by the walls of Terezin, Friedel opened her suitcase and in secret, the children began to create. There are ways to find meaning by looking at art and listening to music. I think it's important as artists to bring that to others. It's not just the child in Terezin. The Terezin child also expresses the feelings of many children in this country now let people know this is how I feel this is what I want you to know about me these Omaha students are just beginning to learn about the Holocaust we really wanted to show that that children were a big part of this story what do you along the way they the will meet Friedel students from Terezin we can't teach about the Holocaust unless we give the kids some context. We had to think of a way to get them to connect. I mean, you know, they don't get it. And we chose the topic of freedom. How about, if my freedom were taken away? If my freedom were taken away, I would fight for the freedom. We couldn't follow our dreams. We couldn't listen to our iPod all day. If freedom were gone, every day would not want to be lived. If freedom were gone, every day would be lived without drive. If freedom were gone, every day would be lived without purpose. If my freedom was taken away, I would not care to go on. He represented much more than just that poem that he read. It's not easy. It's not easy, so thank you for sharing that. What has happened is their understanding that this topic and the ramifications of what happened in the Holocaust can be translated into their own personal experiences. Well, we want to, I want to know how they felt when this was like happening. To further their lessons, these Omaha students were encouraged to draw, write, and form with their hands. We only put 35 girls in each room. 35 girls had to share a room. Whoa, one room. I could not live in a room with 35 girls. <laughs> I wrote that people were separated by age and gender. Mine's about when they, they had to be punished. And it made them feel weak and hopeless. The children of Terezin created over 5,000 drawings and collages. They wrote newspapers and poems. Their creations were hidden from their Nazi oppressors. 
at the end of the war, they were found stuffed into walls and suitcases. It means that up until the very last moment, you don't give up hope of survival. These children knew that they were meant to die. But hope is a remarkable, remarkable human property of the mind. A century ago, people with intellectual disabilities had few places to go until a Lutheran pastor in the small community of Axtell had a vision of hope. On a June day near the town of Axtell, members of the Dahl family gathered to celebrate the visionary work of their ancestor, Reverend K.G. William Dahl. Pastor Dahl came from southern Sweden in a, a fairly well-to-do family. Uh, his father was a Lutheran pastor. By 1907, Dahl had followed his father's path and was ordained as a Lutheran minister in Illinois. He soon moved to Omaha, where he became friends with a man he simply called Gustav. He was a man who would fuel the passion of Dahl's life. I would surmise he's probably a person that had a mental illness, uh, not a developmental disability, but he had been uh, locked at the county poor farm and actually kept in a locked unit. Pastor Dahl visited him. He had no clothes. He had no food. He'd been mistreated. And Gustav begged Pastor Dahl in Swedish to take him from that place. But it was something Dahl was not in the position to do, and it haunted him for the rest of his life. He just believed that the church should fulfill this need that society had to include people at the margins. Dahl began researching institutional care for people living on the edge of society. Unfortunately, people with disabilities were oftentimes seen as the sign of some sort of genetic flaw. And of course, we didn't know enough about genetic or acquired uh, causes for, for any kinds of disabilities. And so there was shame attached to some of it. Um, the state facility, for years, people were buried with numbers on their graves instead of with names. It happened at many, in many states. In late 1912, a small church in Axtell needed a pastor and hired Dahl. When he arrived, he saw opportunity. He became impressed with the fact that this would be a good place uh, to have an organization, uh, to meet the kinds of human needs that had become a real burden to his heart. Dahl shared his vision with his congregation of creating a home for the disabled. People weren't sure whether or not he would be successful, but the sentiment seemed to be, it's worth a try. 54 members gave $1 each. In 1912 money, $1 would buy a week of groceries for a family of four. Within three years, the first home was dedicated on the present site of Bethagy Village. It was really faith-based organizations which took the lead in social causes, and not only developmental disabilities, but in many other aspects of, uh, of social needs. But as Dahl's mission was taking shape, he became ill and died from a heart condition. It was 1917, and he was only 34 years old. I can remember riding on his shoulders. It's a little, yeah, he died when I was just two years old. The loss was hard, but Dahl's pioneering work at Bethagy Village continued. As yet another Lutheran charity was taking shape in another small Nebraska town. Martin Luther Homes began in 1925 in Sterling. Granddad was one of the five founders. He was cut from that traditional German paterfamilias kind of model, and um, I think ran a pretty tight ship at home, you know, but obviously was a man of compassion. Five men of Lutheran faith, but of German heritage, organized a groundbreaking school for children with disabilities. The word got out within the German Lutheran community that they were beginning Martin Luther, and people arrived to be served before the work on the school was done. 
the school quickly filled with children from near and far and with the support of many communities and many faiths it flourished there was a newsletter that uh, circulated and unabashedly asked for money <laughs> and for soap and for clothing and for canned goods and school supplies and just just everything the support that came from people even during the depression who had little to nothing the farmers who gave of their crops the women who came and canned in 1953 martin luther holmes moved to its present location in beatrice With growing demand for good homes and schools for people with disabilities, the work of both Martin Luther Homes in Beatrice and Bethany Mission in Axtell expanded beyond Nebraska. I think both organizations were ahead of their time. In fact, I know they were. Martin Luther Home provided a state-of-the-art educational facility. Much before special education was required, at Bethagy, we had therapeutic services, such as physical therapy, occupational therapy. We had a program that you would now think of as a special education program before it was ever required. So both organizations have a rich history of just doing what I would say is the right thing well before it was required by law or regulation. In 2003, the two Nebraska-grown Lutheran charities decided it was time to unite into a single nonprofit, and they called it Mosaic. I'm saving my money for my next vacation for 2014. There you go. Where are you going? Uh, I, that's one I cannot tell. And Are you going to use a camper and go to the mountains? Uh, well, uh, yes, I probably <laughs> will. Now you spilled your secret. Well, no, you spilled my secret. <laughs> and, and Margie always spilling my secret <laughs> on me. We have 36 and, agency and, offices. Okay, good job. In 10 states Sorry. across the United States. I am a temporary caretaker as are all the 5,000 employees of Mosaic, of a legacy that went on for 100 years before us and will go on hopefully for 100 or more after us. Served at Mosaic, I want to welcome you to this grand occasion to celebrate 100 years of service and advocacy. I'm Donna Thompson and we drove to uh, Kearney from Texas. Beth G. Mosaic has taken care of my son for 24 years, and they have done an excellent job. Axtell, Nebraska, 10 februari 1913. Kära syster Lisa, hjärtligt tack för ditt kära brev. Jag ska We would say Betfage. Our grandmother said Betfage. We have learned to say Betfage. <laughs> It's a bit so, troublesome. Yeah, we, 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 we do our best. Yeah. Our grandmother really kept the, this uh, chain between Sweden and Betfege uh, very alive. Our parents went out here to see this, and our aunt, and now our elder sisters, uh, granddaughters have connection. We hope to visit in June your affectionate brother, William. I was asked what makes this place special and all I can think about is it's the people it's just this community that's been created built in 1916 and still standing strong this venerable building is a symbol of service and love Eighty years ago, we weren't speaking the same language. We had a different heritage. Now, eighty years later, 
We're speaking the same language. We're uh, starting from the same same kind of place with the same kind of premises, and we will do better working together than we would do working separately. The history that is shared within. I had high expectations for this weekend, but the lid's been blown off of that. This has exceeded everything that I ever hoped would happen. It all began here, and this Midwest ethic of loving and caring for your neighbor continues today. I adore what everybody is doing with me, and I do appreciate that. There you have it. Yes. Right, Thank you, Marty. You're welcome. And aren't you full of surprises? <laughs> no, you are. And finally, thousands converge on Pierce, Nebraska and spend millions at an auction of vintage cars from the last century. Oh, yeah. 34. 34. One mile, two mile. Yeah. How many miles? Five mile on them or less. That old low mileage truck over there, I'd like to have it. Oh, uh, every one of them I'd like to have. I'm looking at the pickups and the Chevelles. We got a wagon over there with 300 miles. No, I haven't even got started looking at all of them yet. And I'm thinking that these prices are going to skyrocket. That would be my, my guess. Well, I think they're going to go higher than they're worth. I imagine there's a lot more money here than what I've got. $32,000 right there. It's awesome to have. Uh, 50 cars sitting here that's brand new. I don't know if, if, if Lambrick knew it or not when he was doing it, because all Chevys, most of them are collectible. 51, this is it. I give 900 bucks for it. It's exciting just to see people looking at old Chevys. It really is unbelievable. 15,000, I'm 58 years old, and I've never seen this in my lifetime. It's like a time capsule, you know, they're just preserved. It takes you back in time. And you know, people want a piece of history. Watch our stories online at netnebraska.org slash Nebraska Stories. And go to Facebook to like us and leave a comment. Join the Nebraska Stories conversation. Sustained funding for arts coverage on Nebraska Stories is provided by the H. Lee and Carol Gendler Charitable Fund, the Nebraska Arts Council, and the Nebraska Cultural Endowment. Additional funding is provided by the Nebraska Office of Highway Safety.